Scott has so graciously agreed to do all of the actual work. I just talk. It's, it's a great gift if you can get it. I like it a lot. <laughs> okay, so we're going to do the molar bond gas. The classic lab, as you know, is to generate uh, hydrogen gas by reacting a known mass of magnesium with excess HCl in an inverted glass measuring tube. So what Scott did, first of all, was he added a pre-measured amount of 3 molar HCl to that gas measuring tube, and now he's going to fill it all the way to the very tippy top with water. And without mixing yet, because he's carefully poured it down the side. Okay. And, uh, of course, in the classic lab, you calculate the molar volume of hydrogen gas. You use a known measured mass of magnesium, you measure the volume of gas that is produced, and you apply all of the gas laws. And this is truly an ABC lab. You have to do Avogadro's law, Boyle's law sort of in there, the combined gas law, even Dalton's law, and all of those are used along with stoichiometry to calculate the molar volume of a gas. So he's going to go set it up, and we've i uh, got a little piece of magnesium, which we did pre-measure, but I'll tell you how we did that. Because what we've done here, in order to transition a dip where you can go ahead and, and do that, and what you're going to see, as he gets that in there, good. Any hands or Okay. Is as the HCl begins to, to go down to the bottom of the tube there, you're, it's going to touch the magnesium and pretty soon it's going to be, re begin to react with the magnesium and it's going to start generating some gas. It's not doing it yet because the HCl hasn't moved really down. That's actually a good thing. So how could you use, how could you transition this classic lab, which is simply, it's a bunch of calculations. I mean, it's all the gas laws and just a lot of calculations. How can you transition that to import? Well, you can start by asking a fundamental question, which is, well, do you ever have to fill containers with gas? And do you have to calculate how much gas might fill that container? Nothing yet, remember? <laughs> it's a watched pot never boils. A watched tube never generates any gas. It will slowly begin to generate some hydrogen gas. But rather than do this as a traditional cookbook calculations lab, we've done it as what's called a challenge lab. So you would promote inquiry with the use of science practice skills. But how can you take that lab, which is very heavy on the calculations and very much a cookbook lab, how can you transition that to make it more of a reasoning and a critical thinking lab? And there's a number of things you can do. And again, you can apply these tactics to any lab that you're doing. Okay? The first thing you can do, and this is if you're going to do your first inquiry lab, I would say start here. Take away the data tables and take away the post-lab calculations, you know, where it says divide x by z in order to determine this and then take that number and do this with it. Take all of that away. All you've given them is an, uh, is an objective. You don't even put a data table in there, so they have to figure out how they're going to organize this data. At first, they might just simply write everything out with in a, not in a tab tabular form. You know, and that's okay. And you do that. You put it in a table because it organizes it. Let the students organize the data because that's a science practice skill. Learning how to do that is not necessarily the easiest thing. So you could start with simply taking away all the data tables and everything. You could start with the demonstration, and, and this is something I've been talking about for a number of years, is promoting inquiry using demonstrations. You could show them, and that's really going to town now very well, and we'll in a few minutes say what the, the objective there is going to be, and we'll see how well we did. You could say that's the setup, you could simply demonstrate it, and you could then tell the students, okay, you have to actually write out the procedure for how to do this in order to achieve uh, the, the result, which is to calculate the molar volume. And this gets to what we were talking about before, which is the inquiry guidance. They have to figure out, well, what do I need to know in order to calculate molar volume? See, in a traditional lab, you tell them that. And again, there's a little bit of a bridge that they need to do in some science.
science practice and reasoning skills to get there. And they need to figure out what their variables are going to be and what other factors might affect it and so on. And that's really going very fast now. My favorite way to do it, however, is to make it a challenge or to set a target. And this idea of challenge labs or target labs actually comes from two of our very favorite teachers, one of whom we are extremely excited is, of course, presenting the morning of chemistry tomorrow, and that's Bob Becker. Bob Becker has designed what he calls a series of target labs. And the idea is that you simply give them a target. The other person who did this is Jeff Brackett. He called his challenge lab. So make it a challenge. I guarantee that you will increase student investment and their interest in this procedure if you say your goal is that you have to generate a specific volume of gas at the experimental temperature and pressure, and then you make them figure out how it is. And so the challenge that, I, that we set for ourselves here was to generate 45 milliliters of gas in this tube. Now you might say, well, that's pretty simple. All I have to do is do the stoichiometry. I write out the balanced chemical equation and so on. But you know, there's all those gas laws that are part of this, right? Dalton's law? Why do I need Dalton's law? Well, there's water in that tube, so there's water vapor in that gas mixture. They have to figure out how much water vapor there will be. That de depends on temperature. Do you see that now all of a sudden there's a whole lot of thinking going on, or at least should be going on in the students' minds? They need to figure out, well, what's my temperature? And let's see if we, we assume, you know, we had to figure this out before we got here. So we just assumed that the temperature was going to be 22 degrees and the barometric pressure was going to be 740, 740 milliliters mercury because that's what it is back home. And of course that gives us an out that if it doesn't work and we don't get 45 milliliters, we blame it on the altitude or the pressure or whatever else. I think we're in the, yeah, are we in Denver? We calculated it from Denver. So that, that's, that's what we've got going on here. Oh, you're pretty good, Scott. Uh, 21.1 right now, so so that's going to be a little bit of an experimental error. But again, they could set it up and say, okay, you, you're going to have to do it at whatever temperature it's going to be, and so on. So now all of a sudden you have a much more challenging lab, and I guarantee you that you will have student engagement and ownership of the results. Do you think they are going to want to generate 45.00 milliliters of gas in that tube? Oh, you betcha. And they're going to start competing against one another. Hey, what are you doing? And you know, they're going to do, there's going to be a little body English going on here, okay, as they're watching that and they see that it's getting pretty close to 45. Oh, they're going to be going, okay, stop, just that's it. No more. Yeah, <laughs> are we past? Okay, so we'll blame it on the pressure. <laughs> So it's a challenge, and that's good. Now, is the purpose here to get a right answer? Not so much. The purpose is really all of the reasoning that you're talking about. Now, there's another part that we haven't done, and that is that you do have to equalize it to atmospheric pressure. So he's actually going to do that right now, and we'll see where we are when he does that. All right. Now... It's actually showing 51.0, but when I really equalize it, it's 45. .0. No, actually, it's, it's like 51. Okay, so uh, we were really off. Yeah. Well, I would give you a C, and I'm going to take a C plus. <laughs> it's a challenge. The part that's good here is they're doing all the thinking, and that's really what you want. You know, there's the old saying that don't work harder than your students do. How many of you don't work harder than your students do? I mean, you all, we all do. That's what we do because we're invested in it. We want to increase the students' investment in all of this so that they want to do it as well. Now, another, so we talked about various strategies for opportunities for inquiry. And again, 
It's not that you do it for this lab versus another. Any quantitative lab can be done as a challenge or a target lab. You can take away the data tables and post lab questions for any lab and simply give them an objective. It has to then be a very well written objective because they need to do all the thinking of how they're going to make that into a guided inquiry lab. Uh, we talked about starting with the demonstration so they kind of have that prior knowledge of seeing something and then developing the procedure from it. The other very important thing to do in terms of scientific reasoning skills is authentic error analysis. And I say authentic error analysis because how many of you have as part of your normal write-ups for your AP labs to talk about sources of error and their effect on the experiment? Everybody asks them to do it, right? And what's a typical response you might get? Anybody? I spilled something, yes. But what I really love is when they say, I might have spilled something. How many of you have seen that in the sample write-ups? Yeah, you're prepared, I know. And you go, okay, did you spill something? Or did you not spill something? Of course, they always say, you know, it's balance error. Or it's the, the, exper it's the random error in the measuring and the volume and the transfers. Now, some of those are very legitimate. And certainly, choosing the appropriate volumetric glassware to give you the precision you need is all a part of that experimental design. So you know when we said that there's more to a good experiment than just test tubes and chemicals? That's what we mean. What kind of, do you use a graduated cylinder to measure the volume? Do you use a volumetric flask? Do you use a burette? Do you use a pipette? What level of precision do you need? Those are all things that are authentic opportunities for inquiry in a lab that you want students to think about, because that's really what we're trying to get at eventually. So authentic error analysis doesn't have anything to do with, well, I might have spilled something, or the balance might have been dirty, or my dog ate it, or something like that. Authentic error analysis is, well, we didn't get a good result here. Why not? What were our assumptions? Well, what would have happened if there had been a bubble of air that was in that gas measuring tube before we inverted it. You know, we said, stop, you have to fill that to the tippy top with water. And not let air in. And not let any air in. Why is that? Well, because if there's some air in it already, then obviously the volume that you're measuring isn't all due to the hydrogen gas and the water. Now, what's interesting about that is you don't just let them say, well, what would have happened? You want to really want to target down to the level of, all right, your objective was to measure the molar volume of gas. Would that value be high or low if you had had a bubble of air, if you had some air in the tube already? That's getting them to think about it in a higher order than just, I might have spilled something, you know. So another one would be, well, what if the magnesium had been black and dull rather than silver and shiny? And again, the, the authentic error analysis is, would your calculated molar volume be higher or lower as a result of that? This is getting at the level of the critical thinking that I think we want students to do. Now, I am happy to report that, of course, it would never be true that Flint Scientific Magnesium would be black and dull rather than silver and shiny. All of that, that was very silver and shiny. What would be the molar volume? Would it be higher or lower if the magnesium were partially oxidized already? You would think you had more moles of magnesium than you did, so you're dividing by a larger number than it actually is, so it would actually be smaller. So that wouldn't have given us a higher volume of gas here. We would have gotten a lower one. And it's the opposite if you had air in there, so you had to think about it. And that's good. That's what you want.